uh, yeah, uh, just I'll. Does that work? Uh, I'll start the recording. Uh, Uh, I'll just make it, work. it worked. Yeah, I'll just uh, have it. Okay, uh, so uh, hello and welcome to Med News Week, a keynote conference where we aim to bring you the most cutting edge information from med medicine's global leaders. I'm Rabab Huned and I'll be your host for today. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge the incredible team that helps to make these events a reality. Our founders are two internationally recognized researchers, Dr. Jan Diefman and Dr. Chandra Park. Our chairs include Dr. Park and Diefman. Our associate directors include Madhuri, Muskan, Gayatri, and Helena. Our associate managers include Alexandra, William, and Ahmed Aziz. Our education committee includes uh, Sean, Viviana, Jade, Harshal, Sri Harshita, Soumya, Imad, and uh, Shrivika, and myself. So we also want to thank our partners, that is Wumevi, and the National Society of High School Scholars, and I3 Health, uh, which is a CME, CP, uh, NCPD, CPE accredited organization with the mission of enhancing the proficiency of the multidisciplinary team by providing evidence-based activities that address unmet educational needs for the healthcare team. Oncology Data Advisor is the I3's health new website uh, that delivers up-to-date clinically relevant content, interviews, and commentary from key opinion leaders in oncology. The moderator for today's event is Helena. And now to introduce our keynote speaker, that is Dr. Brian Andrew Van Tyne. Uh, Dr. Brian is a professor of medicine in the Department of Medicine and professor of pediatrics at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. He is the sarcoma program director, the director of the phase one program at Alvin J. Seidman Cancer Center and the co-director of the Adolescents and Young uh, Adult Program uh, at the Alvin J. Can uh, Seidman Cancer Center. He has served as a principal investigator of more than 130 clinical trials, including phase one and phase two involving immunotherapies to treat HIV-associated lymphomas and Kaposi sarcomas. He has authored more than 148 publications, more than 12 book chapters, and reviewed multiple renowned journals, such as Journal of Orthopedic Research, Annals of Oncology, Journal of Clinical Oncology, Clinical Cancer Research, and Rare Tumors. With that, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Brian Andrew. Uh, the floor is yours, Doctor. Thank you so much, and thank everybody for listening today. It's quite a privilege to get to uh, present to you today. And so the topic that I was given was translating metabolic therapies into sarcoma. I know the most exciting things that are going on, such as the FDA approval of TIL therapy for melanoma yesterday, which is really exciting within the area of immunotherapy. There's an evolving landscape of metabolic therapies in sarcoma. And I, I think that one of the things I often post on Twitter is I'm making the tricarboxylic acid uh, cycle uh, important again, because you actually, when you're memorizing this in medical school, it actually is becoming important for therapeutics. And so from that standpoint, I'm going to kind of walk you through kind of a, a tenure journey from a bench uh, discovery all the way to a phase three clinical trial and all the trials that have spun off from this in terms of trying to harness tumor metabolism to actually treat uh, a rare tumor called sarcoma, but you'll see if throughout the course of this, it's spinning up into lung cancer and other cancers at the same time, all from an initial discovery that happened almost from 2011. So it's been a long journey, but I think the greatest advice I can give any young aspiring physician scientist is if you think you have the cure for cancer in your bench and you don't translate it, it helps no one. So you do need to figure out if you're at actually right. And that's what this kind of journey I've been on is going to show me pretty soon. So I do have a lot of disclosures. And that's because as a clinical trialist, I work with a lot of uh, different companies. So I think the first thing we really need to decide is what does metabolism mean for the purpose of this talk? And for the purpose of this talk, really metabolism is the biology of carbon. And what I mean by that is carbon sources need to be made into protein, DNA, RNA, lipids, et cetera, all the building blocks that allow cancer to divide and allow cancer to become 
proliferative. And you need all sorts of different avenues uh, and different pathways in cancer, which are going to be different than actual normal biology to really harness tumor metabolism. But at the end of the day, it's how a cancer makes more. Cancer doesn't exist to kill anyone. Cancer just exists to make more. And so we really do have to think from a metabolic standpoint how that's different. And so one of the things that I like to think about is how do metabolic pathways work? And so one of the things I like in my personal life is watches. And so I do collect watches. And what's neat is watches have gears. And so when you think about how metabolic pathways work, once you can kind of get from this side through this gear and over to here, right? So if you put any pressure on metabolism, you can still get from this side to this side to this side because you just rewire the pathways, you redemonstrate it, and the goal of cancer is always to get the carbon molecules to where it wants. What's interesting in cancer is that not all pathways are connected anymore. And so you can no longer get from this gear over to this gear. And this actually allows for what we call therapeutic opportunities. And by understanding all the changes that cancer makes to really change how we can make it, so make them highly proliferative, just so that cells make more cells, we really do begin to understand where to put drugs. And what's neat about metabolism is everything's an enzyme. And most enzymes can have inhibitors. And so, you know, there's a lot of people working to try the drug transcription factors, which is really hard. These all have catalytic sites, and there's a whole group of drugs that are coming out for this. And so you do have to kind of think about the body in two ways. First, you've got normal cellular metabolism in an adult. An adult is not rapidly dividing outside of hair follicles and the colon turning over and skin turning over. So like your heart isn't rapidly dividing. So when glucose enters a cell, it's mainly the biology of glycolysis making lactate and ATP. But what it doesn't really need to do is make nucleic acids. It doesn't need a lot of de novo serine biosynthesis. It doesn't need to turn over a lot of phospholipids. It doesn't need to make a lot of amino acids. This is the biology of normal cells. But what cancer does is all of a sudden, it brings back a protein that you'll learn in embryology called protein kinase mammalian isoform number two. It's a really fancy protein, and it puts in a block, and that block in glycolysis actually sends the carbons back up, and that results in the carbons being used to make amino acids and phospholipids and nucleic acids from various steps, and there's this wonderful relationship between serine biosynthesis and PKM2 that's the focus of a lot of laboratories that are trying to really harness metabolic therapies, but this really does begin to identify places to go. So, you know, the therapy using metabolism in cancer is actually old. And so acute lymphocytic leukemia, which is a, or ALL, is, you know, a disease that children get. And it's treated with a degrading enzyme called asparagenase. And that depletes asparagine. And what's interesting about ALL is that to most cells, asparagine is a, dis a dispensable amino acid because they can just make it themselves. And so asparaginase depletes all the extracellular asparagine. And because <coughs> asparagine synthetase is not expressed in ALL, and you put these cells into a starvation state, when you deplete all of the asparagine, they die. And this really is kind of the fundamental idea where a cell is put into a starvation state, which is a subset of something called autophagy, and that leads to cell death. And so one of the first questions my laboratory asked is, within soft tissue and bone sarcomas, is there a parallel to this? Is there something we can do metabolically to try to bring uh, an metabolic therapy into clinical development? And so these are what we need. We need a biomarker. And as I've learned over my career, you would need at least a pair of drugs that are dependent on that biomarker because it's amazing how fast tumor metabolism adapts. To most tumor metabolic enzymes that I've studied in humans, tumors can adapt in as little as a week. And that means the drugs are working, 
but it really understanding that adaptation becomes important. We really do need what you call in vivo evidence, or at least before we put something in a human, it needs to work in another animal system because we don't want to jump straight to humans with ideas that we don't understand and then not understand at the end of the day why they don't work. And the most important thing, especially as I'm what we have, uh, that I'm both an MD and a PhD, is I get to be my own clinical collaborator. You have to test these things in clinical trial, or you'll never know and you'll never learn it, and you'll never actually be able to develop these therapies successfully. So just to orient everybody, sarcomas are a parallel word to carcinomas, and within the sarcoma family, which is tumors of mesenchymal origin, there's about 100 rare cancers that each have different biologic diversity. The only thing they have in common is their mesenchymal origin. You know, the annual incidence is about 15,000 cases a year divided into those 100 rare two subtypes. As a whole, if you take agents across all the cancers, you see limited activity. But if you focus on one, chemosensitivity is variable. So something like synovial sarcoma or Ewing sarcoma, which you may have heard more about in medical school, these are chemosensitive, whereas something like alveolar soft part sarcoma, for which Alice Chen gave a different um, med news uh, talk recently, because she led the FDA approval of atezolizumab for it, you don't give chemotherapy to those because they just don't respond. So getting back to biomarkers, there are at least five biomarkers in the sarcoma family that are interesting. So there is a mutation that happens in IDH, which happens in Congress or colons. There is a subgroup of paragangliomas and gastrointestinal stromal tumors that lack a succinyl dehydrogenase. We're going to focus on point three today, which is that most sarcomas, as I'll show you, are deficient in arginosuccinate synthetase one, which is part of the urea cycle. Uh, I have other talks I can give on malic enzyme one deficiencies in synovial sarcoma, which begins to explain why they're chemosensitive. And then there's a new biology coming out, so phosphoglycerate dehydrogenase, both osteosarcoma and Ewing's. What's interesting about that is these are other metabolic pathways where there's drugs. And so there are PHGDH inhibitors coming. There are ways to drug ASS1. There are IDH inhibitors. And there's an entire phareptotic world going after the ME1 deficiencies in synovial sarcoma. So these really are all leading to different avenues of metabolic translation against enzymes within the sarcoma family. And so we're going to focus on point number three. So a long time ago, I was working with Brian Rubin, who is at the Cleveland Clinic and he's the chairman of pathology there. And in collaboration with him, his laboratory looked at 701 different specimens of sarcoma across 45 different histologies and came out and said that 88.3% of these didn't express arginosuccinate synthetase 1. And so if you see here in this, this is what we call an H and E, which is kind of gives you the architecture of a cell. This brown uh, dye right here shows you the expression. And then you have blue nuclei behind. When you don't have any brown, everything's blue. And most of the uh, tumors that were tested just didn't express this, suggesting that this might be something that is important. This is the most common defect that we're seeing across all the sarcomas. P53 mutations only occur about half the time, and this is now at 88%. And so what is arginosuccinate synthetase 1? So if you go back to your basic biochemistry book that most people never wanted to open again, and I had to reopen again before, when I got into this, the urea cycle takes ammonia and bicarbonate and combines that into carbamyl phosphate. That is shunted through ornithine transcarboxylase, and they make, and, and that makes citrulline. Citrulline goes through arginosuccinate synthetase 1, it makes arginosuccinate. But to do that, it must pull aspartate into the urea cycle. Aspartate is a major nucleotide used to make nucleic acids. And because arginine, which is what we're going to get to, is only semi-essential to, you can just bring it in from the outside. A lot of tumors choose to shut this off. Then you go through lyase and make fumarate, and then you actually make arginine. Arginine has a lot of nitric oxide biology. 
and then arginine goes is made into through arginase into ornithine, and there's a lot of arginase inhibitors that happen for you know the treatment of macrophages. And what you have is this spinning urea cycle until you silence this, and then you have a block at citrullate. And the way you overcome this block is you just import arginine to get around it. But this block is important for the rest of the lecture. So anytime I make citrulline, a tumor can't do anything with it. So let's get into the therapies for this. So the first therapy for arginosuccinate synthetase 1 must work against that biomarker. And that would be ways of depleting cells of arginine and basically putting them into a starvation state. So there are a number of ways to do this. And so the you can either use arginase, arginine decarboxylase, or arginine deaminase. Arginine decarboxylase only comes into play with free arginine and arginine at the end of a protein. So it's not that highly useful. But arginase and arginine deaminase are interesting. Arginase catabolizes arginine to ornithine. Ornithine can be used for a lot of polyamine biology, which leads into other pathways. It has a low affinity for arginine, and it's optimal at a high pH. It's not the world's best pegylated recombinase. It has gone into some phase two clinical trials, but really hasn't translated yet. Arginine deaminase takes us from arginine to citrulline, which is right before the block, releases ammonia, and is given us actually a shot. So this has been pegylated. It's a mycoplasma enzyme. And so because of that, it, you can give this a weekly shot to patients. And so what this shot does is really just take this nitrogen and arginine and make it into an oxygen. Simple. It really only has two side effects, which is really kind of interesting. You can get an injection site reaction from the shot itself, probably from a lot of the things that are used to keep it in solution. And it can cause gout because it forms uh, urea. And so what you end up with is a simple metabolic process that depletes extracellular arginine. So what does that do to solve comas metabolically? So using kind of a really fancy assay, I'm gonna introduce you to three cell lines. And the first is what we call SKLMS1, which is a lyomyosarcoma cell line. The next is SKUT1, which is a uterine tumor that's a sarcoma. And then to show that this is not gonna be kept just in a sarcoma box, SKML2 is actually a melanoma cell line. It's all of these are ASS1 deficient. And if you use the autophagosomes in a cell for a surrogate marker for the starvation state and for autophagy, you find that if you add arginine deaminase to any three of these cell lines, what you see is an increase in autophagosomes, suggesting that they go into the starvation state. And so we do a lot of what we call metabolomics. And you get hundreds and hundreds of different enzymes and you sit down and try to make patterns out of them. And there were three things that jumped out at us early on. One is that the amount of glutamine, the longer you treated these cells, the less glutamine you could find in these cells. Two, there was a spike early on in serine before it went back to a homeostatic level. And then three was this loss of lactic acid, suggesting that with an initial starvation state, you've got these switches going on, one with a glutamine biology, one with serine biology, and one with lactic acid biology. And this is all going to, these are key parts of therapies that are now being developed. And so can we really exploit this? And so I kind of build on a cell reports paper that came out a while back and kind of show you the story that actually leads to a second story that leads to a trial. And so if you think of a cell, this is extracellular arginine. This is intracellular arginine. If you cannot make arginine, you have to import it. And so if you target the arginine dependency, pegylated arginine deaminase will degrade extracellular arginine to citrulline and ammonia. And so if you look at healthy cells, they have arginine, blood cells have arginine, or the blood has arginine, and then ASS1 deficient cancer cells are actually pulling it in from the blood. If you deplete it, what happens is healthy cells will go and make their own. And the ASS1 deficient sarcoma cells begin a program to try to survive. And so because they can't, they either have to go undergo our metabolic reprogramming during autophagy or they die. And so one of the first things we looked at is, so if you watch cells growing in culture over the course of three days, if you don't treat them 
uh, what they grow out is this red line. And you can see they, they grow out uh, within about three days. The first two cell lines are negative for ASS1. This MG63 cell line is very positive for ASS1. And so what you see is that with increasing amounts of arginine DMNAs, you see that we enter a static phase with uh, ASS1 deficient tumors, but ASS1 proficient tumors, which actually mimic most of the cells in your body because every cell, not only the liver or kidney cells, but every cell in your body has a low amount of ASS1. And so what we saw out of this was cytostasis, and then we looked at cell death. And we didn't see that the arginine starvation state was going to cause cell death. And while keeping tumors from growing is a good thing, killing them is better. And so we began to ask, how can we turn a growth arrest phenotype into cell death? And so the first thing we started to target was the autophagy itself. And I, I think it's interesting in the era of COVID that one of the things we first started looking at is a natural inhibitor of autophagy is actually chloroquine. And so one of the earlier uh, hints we got, and this is something that was going to come back as probably the fifth drug we add later, is that if you don't treat cells, you don't get any cell death. You treat them when the arginine starvation state, you don't get any cell death. If you give them chloroquine, you don't get any cell death. You give them both, and they begin to interrupt this pathway of pro-survival through autophagy, they die. And then if you start looking at a mouse, this is where we see that this is over about 40 days, this cell line will grow out of a mouse. If you give them chloroquine, the tumors don't really care. If you give these arginine DMNAs, they grow out slower. And if you give them chloroquine, they grow out even slower. So this was the first dual metabolic therapy that we were seeing actually be synergistic within tumors. And so what we really began seeing was that once a tumor which is dependent on extracellular arginine, inserts the autophagy state. Yeah, chloroquine can start your journey to cell death. But one of the natural things that happens is you just re-express ASS1 in this metabolic reprogramming period and everything escapes. And so can we target the metabolic response pathways to induce cell death? And so then we did this really interesting technique where you take heavy labeled carbon. And so there are six glucose, six carbons in glucose, and you can use carbon-13 and say, well, where do these things go? And I'm just going to show you a bunch of pictures. And so if you think of glucose entering a cell and going through glycolysis, at 3PG, you can take a right-hand turn, make serine, and make glycine. Or you can go down to pyruvate. This is that initial rheostat I showed you that in, we, most cells don't do this. But when we began looking, and there are by the time you get to serine, what you see is that you're looking at less atoms. And so red numbers, which you'll see here, or pink, are unlabeled carbons. Green are three labeled carbons. This is two labeled carbons. This is one labeled carbons. And what you see is that as you begin treating cells when the arginine starvation state, especially short term, and this is long term, but short term, you see that we begin making serine. And that serine's labeled. And then we go in from serine to glycine. But what's interesting is there's a pathway called the folate cycle. And the, what's interesting here is that this, you're now down to two carbons from three carbons. That one carbon, if it's catalyzed in this step, goes down into the folate cycle, which becomes important, right? And so if you look at both lactate production, it's dropped. If you look at citrate, it's down from glucose. And so basically you're not coming down anymore, you're going this way. And so if we begin looking at the regulation of carbon metabolism, you basically can go through lactate dehydrogenase and make lactate. You can go through a block that happens through PDH, through acetyl-CoA to the TCA cycle. You can look at PKM2. And what happened is these cells that had a high level of PKM2 we're really regulating the ability to go through this pathway. And then when you don't have enough serine, these go back and forth. And as you really want to make serine, you make phospho-PKM2. And so if you look at the ratio of phospho-PKM2, you ended up with it lost and staying down, which really gave you a serine pathway that su suggested 
that we were looking at folate cycle activation. Well, if you look at lactic acid, this is controlled. And what you end up with is phospho-LDH is actually what you care about. Everybody only talks about LDH, but phospho-LDH is actually a, the thing that controls whether or not lactate is made. And so you really end up with decrete lactate production. Citrate that came from glucose drops off. And so what these tumors have done is they have really decreased the flux into the TCA cycle from glucose. And they have really sent it in a serine direction by upregulating the rate limiting enzyme, which is phospho PHGDH, which actually becomes really important to osteosarcoma biology later. And so what you end up with is arginine deaminase really blocks here, blocks here because all of a sudden you're getting rid of this block because the cell is actually making a series of metabolic permanent decisions so that it can survive, right? Well, this is druggable. And so if you think about it, there are two things that are interesting here. So there are some early PHGDH inhibitors such as CBR5884. And what you see is that these are all synthetic lethal in terms of combination. So you can actually drug at this point, but serine can also come in from the extracellular uh, space into the folate cycle and allow for sort of a bypass, but you can actually drug this with mexotrexate. Now you see that the amount of cell death that happens is even greater. And so looking at this is probably a, that's something we might work on to develop osteosarcoma later, which we actually currently are. There's a hint here that you can use folate cycle derivatives to really make a metabolic choice because drugging the folate cycle is also a metabolic therapy. And so this begins to build out really a inhibition of glycolysis and a production of serine. And so if you actually then say, well, the other major feeder to the TCA cycle actually comes from glutamine and cells are dependent on glutamine for energy metabolism. And there's a drug called CB839 and a couple others that are out there in phase one. And what you find is that we did glutamine tracings. And out of this comes one clinical trial I'm gonna show you later. And really something that's being built into current lab work that's gonna be added to the clinical trial I'm gonna tell you about. So what you see is the glutamine goes down when it, and the amount of glutamate goes down because cells aren't going to hyperuse this. When you start looking at the TCA metabolites, sometimes down is up, especially when you're doing a tracing. And so what we're going to show you based on some other data I'm going to show you in a little bit is that the TCA cycle has gone into a hyperfunction. And so by the time our tracing was done, we found that all the metabolites have been made into asparagine. But what was interesting here in the corner is glutathione has gone. And so we can deplete cells of their redox buffer through glutathione using arginine DMNAs. And so that's important for later. And then we just looked at the uptake of radioactive glutamine to these cells. And so the longer we treat these, the more glutamine addicted they get. We started looking at glutaminase and GDH and basically saw an upregulation of all the enzymes that make you use glutamine to survive. So before when the TCA cycle wasn't using glucose, it's now going to suggest that it looks at glutamine. And once again, we get to a point where if you look at cells grown over three days, this blue bar will be untreated cells. These cells treated with a glutaminase inhibitor, nothing happens. The side effects of the glutaminase inhibitors in people are pretty much close to zero. Arginine deaminase stops things from growing. And here you can see that you can actually kill because anything below the yellow line is killing. So then we went and looked in animals and this was an early experiment before some of the inhibitors were available. And so if you knock down glutaminase, these, or you knock down GFP as a control, all three of these ends, mouse curves here grow out at about the same rate. If you treat with arginine deaminase over about 30 days, you have basically a cytostatic tumor. But what's interesting, if they don't have glutaminase, these tumors actually shrink in half. And what eventually grows out either re-expresses ASS1 or glutaminase because it got around the hairpin, but this was tumor response. So then we looked across breast cancer and colon cancer and lung cancer and glioblastoma and head and neck and osteosarcoma using all of these drugs and found that as long as cells were negative for ASS1, this would work. 
And so really it's a biomarker that's not just specific to sarcoma, but sarcoma gives you a lot of clues how to use it. So now we have a switch to glutamine biology, upregulation of oxidative phosphorylation, and then this happened, which was we basically proved that this is a shift in the Warburg effect. And so if you look at extracellular acidification or the production of lactate against the oxygen consumption that's used by the mitochondria, and if you look at these three dots here, this is where all these cell lines that are growing in culture start. As you begin treating with the arginine starvation state, you get a loss in all three cell lines of their ability to produce lactate. And then the longer you treat it, the more you move to the right and the more oxygen consumption you have, which is really a decreased Warburg phenotype. And it's a permanent decision these cells make to survive. And so what happened was my graduate student, Jeff Kramer at the time, did one last experiment looking at nucleotide biology before he left. And out came this curve. What you have here is that the blue line is nanomolars of gemcitabine. So you can treat with a thousand nanomoles of gemcitabine. And the wild type cells just don't care. What gemcitabine is, is a nucleotide mimic that can't be extended upon. And what happens is if you get enough of gemcitabine in place of cytidine, uh, these cells die because they can't replicate their DNA, but these didn't pick it up. All of a sudden the arginine starvation state gave us cell death against gemcitabine. And this was an observation that was run upon by a brilliant woman postdoc named Bethany Brudner, uh, just an absolutely brilliant scientist. And she publishes a paper that is the mechanism by which a trial is being done. And so we're gonna walk you through this and I have to teach you a pathway. So arginine goes in through a transporter called CAT1 cationic transporter one. Gemcitabine comes in through a transporter called HENT1. It's an efluxer. And so what happens is gemcitabine and all, all of the nucleotides can come in and out of this. DCK will phosphorylate these nucleotides and trap them. And then as you're adding phosphates to these, so this is triphosphate gemcitabine, at the level of RRM2, you choose whether or not to make DCTP or gemcitabine. If you don't have a lot of RRM2, you use gemcitabine preferentially, and therefore you inhibit, you go into DNA, and this leads to death because it's a chain terminator. But all nucleotides are the end product of metabolism. And so nucleotide biology also makes gemcitabine a metabolic therapy. And so in sarcoma, there is a regimen put together by Bob Mackey where we use gemcitabine, which is a nucleoside terminator, with docetaxel, which is a mitotic inhibitor. And so we did a little experiment where we added docetaxel into this experiment. And we found that in the arginine starvation state, and I'm giving you the answer and going to show you the data, docetaxel, for some reason, is a CMIC stimulator. And CMIC is a master metabolic regulator regulating transcription factor. And what happens is it stabilizes it in the nucleus. This drives up the expression of HNT. And so all of a sudden you put this many, many HNT transporters on the cell surface in response to the starvation state because these cells want nucleotides. Interestingly, DCK, that expression goes up. So you're trapping your gemcitabine and you lose RRM2. And so you're preferentially using this. And this is the actual mechanism we're going to show you. And so what happened was we looked at what docetaxel did. And so a growth inhibition is different than a death curve. And so if you look at what ADI does with docetaxel in this uh, salmon color, you see that it really there's not much of an effect of docetaxel in these cell lines. They begin, if you give them with ADI, you see a little bit more of an effect. Long term, there was some biology to docetaxel. But the, the, the quintessential piece of data that showed up in my office one day was this. She showed that the expression of the transporter for gemcitabine, which is also called SLC29A1, goes up by sixfold. And that was one of these transforming moments where we said, well, there's some biology here to this regimen. 
And so when you actually treat cells with gemcitabine on top of docetaxel, if you look at the cell line that's treated with gemcitabine alone, ADI gemcitabine, then ADI long term, what you get is the longer you put cells into the starvation state, because of the choices they make, the more sensitive they are to gemcitabine. And so you move from an IC50 of about 10 to the minus 7th to 10 to the minus 14th. That's a seven log shift in terms of your sensitivity. And so then we looked at what happened to the expression of DCK in the cytoplasm. This goes up from about just under twofold to sixfold, which would trap gemcitabine. We then looked at what happened to RRM2 when you lose 75% of its expression. So then we started looking at all the combinations of what happens in cell death, whether you get treat these with nothing with arginine VMNAs, with gemcitabine, with docetaxel, with gemcitabine and docetaxel, docetaxel and ADI. And remember, this is a clinically approved regimen. We're getting about 10% cell death. But then when you actually look at all three of them, we're getting massive cell death. And then we began looking at uh, a really fancy surrogate. So instead of using gemcitabine, we put carboxyfluorescine, which is green, onto cytidine. And what you did, we did was look at uptake. And so I think pictures are worth a million words. So if you put the probe in front of, and don't treat these cells, red are nuclei, green are the probe. You don't see very much green here, even in untreated cells long-term. If we actually treat these, that you now see green cells. They're uptaking this probe. And you could block this entire mechanism by blocking MYC. And so because of that, it became exciting. And so then we did the mouse experiment. And it was, it was a wonderfully, horribly painful mouse experiment, given how many arms are in it. But we let tumors grow in mice till about 200 millimeters cubed. And they grow out in about 30 days. And so if you treat with ADI, there's a statistically significant and probably not that important uh, effect of causing these cells to grow out in a mouse about a week later. You treat with docetaxel, not much happens. You treat with ADI and docetaxel, you get to a little bit more push to the right, and this would be all exciting. But notice I'm going out to 84 days. Or you can just give gemcitabine by itself, and none of this biology seems to matter until you start adding to it. So if you add ADI and gemcitabine, you get tumor shrinkage, but they grow out about the same time. If you just treat with gemcitabine and docetaxel in vivo, it's still superior until you use the triplet. And this became the hallmark by which we went into people. So the mechanism on a biomarker is that in the arginine starvation state, you go from cells that aren't dependent on this efluxer, they aren't dependent on, and they are dependent on extracellular arginine, to cells that because they can't uptake arginine, are now looking for lots of things, including nucleotides. So we're going to now jump from mice to man. And what this is, is a response rate. And so there were 75, 75 patients in this trial, give or take. And so if you look in red, red, cell, red patients, and each one of these is an individual patient, red patients had a complete response, their tumors disappeared. Green patients, had a partial response. Uh, those that are in pink had stable disease, and those that are purple grew out. What's interesting is this was a non-selected trial. Those that have a little red dot at the bottom are ASS1 negative. Those that are blue are ASS1 positive. And so what you see is there are a lot of purple and blues together, and there's a lot of red and greens and reds together. And 14 of the 18 responders in this trial did not express ASS1. But what's interesting is if you take every trial of this size uh, that's used gemcitabine and docetaxel, there were between zero and two complete responders. And so to have six uh, became really interesting. And a lot of these were a disease called leiomyosarcoma, of which the one to two complete responders becomes a uh, higher grab. And so this became a, a phase two trial, and this is the data as it read out. What that led to is an international trial right now called ARGSARC. 
which is a placebo controlled blinded trial where, where you either get arginine DMNA shots or placebo shots, but everybody gets gemcitabine and docetaxel. And because of that, we're going to, we've now taken a, an observation of a biomarker to a phase three clinical trial that I'm helping to lead around the world that was based on a graduate student's work, a postdoc's work, and my good fortune of just letting them do their work. Because part of mentorship is not telling people what to do. But this is then spun out. So because of that, we are now, because of how Bob Mackey wrote the original gemcitabine and docetaxel trial, gemcitabine is given on day one. Gemcitabine and docetaxel are given on day eight. Well, I've just walked you through an entire mechanism where giving arginine deaminase with gemcitabine on week one doesn't make as much sense as giving arginine deaminase with docetaxel on day one and gemcitabine on day two. And because of that, we rewrote the regimen for lung cancer because lung cancer is also a small cell and non-small cell has a subset that are AS1 negative. And we've done a new phase one trial to see how much docetaxel and gemcitabine could be optimized for the treatment of lung cancer. And this is a trial that's being run between here and Virginia and Chicago, looking at using this regimen the way I actually think it should be given which is not how we're doing it in the phase three trial, but for registration purposes, you had to go against the standard of care. Here, we're rewriting the regimen. And if this works in lung cancer, we will probably long-term go back and change how it's given in sarcoma. But remember once upon a time, I told you that glutathione data was there. So, and here's that blow up. So if you look at the amount of GSH, which is the reactive part of glutathione, you see that this is, labeling from glucose. So I wouldn't really worry about the colors so much as the amounts. And this is just normalized. But, and, ah, sorry, not trying to give everybody a seizure. But what you see is this ratio dramatically changes. And so we've written a trial around this now, where we're giving neoadjuvant arginine deaminase with a nitrogen mustard, which is a free radical damaging agent called iposamide, and radiotherapy frontline to patients with stage two and three high-grade sarcoma. And what that allows us to do is really take another observation and really go deep with it. There are planned trials with glutaminase inhibitors. There's planned trials with uh, chloroquine. And my goal of life is to get to a five or six agent, hopefully non-toxic therapy that's all based on a biomarker where we drug the adaptation pathways to the point where the tumors can't survive. But because normal cells don't have the biomarker in the first place, I'm hoping to keep the toxicity down. And what's interesting is that no one does anything in a vacuum. Everyone from our supporters to just, I wanna highlight the work of Jeff Kramer, Bethany Pruner, who really were core to this work. And then all the work that's happened since then, and all my supporters from around the world that really make this happened and all the sarcoma patients that support my lab independently, they make rare tumor research happen. And there is wonderful support from around the world. And these ideas have gone from St. Louis, Missouri to literally a trial that's in phase three that has sites open in Taiwan and Europe. And so because of that, I'm happy to begin a discussion with the rest of the panel. Thank you so much, uh, doctor, for that amazing uh, keynote session. And it was truly educational and the presentation was really informative. Uh, Sarcomas has always amused me and it is quite an eye-opening uh, the way you have explained the biochemistry from the basics of the urea cycle. Uh, it was really amazing. Uh, so I'll hand over the mic uh, to Helena. Thank you, Dr. Ventine, for a wonderful presentation. And um, now we are going to be getting with the questions. 
Thank you for coming and welcome to Discussions with Global Leaders. I am Helena Coloma once again, and we're excited to be speaking with Dr. Van Tyne. We've received a lot of questions and we'll do our best to get through all of them in the time that we have with you. For the first question, I'm actually gonna be passing the mic back over to Rabab. Yes, doctor. So uh, my question to you was, uh, how do you think artificial intelligence has changed the therapeutic approach of sarcomas? And if not yet established, how far can AI help in the future? So, uh, you know, one of the inter interesting things is a lot of things get to sarcoma late. You know, they start off in the big cancers, breast cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, they get to us late. But, you know, I, I think a lot of my co colleagues, especially in the immunotherapy world and then in the big omics world, are using artificial intelligence to begin to identify patterns. You know, I have seen that, you know, things like metabolic analysts and things which are a kind of artificial intelligence and begin to tell us what pathways are important, what transcription patterns are important. But at the same time, you know, I think one of the interesting things about AI is it still must be tested. And I, I think the bar uh, that most people have to realize is we're not going to be able to get around fundamental mechanistic studies using AI. Because I think at the end, AI is a tool, just like every other tool, that will give you great hypotheses that must be proven so that we can take them to patients. And I, I think that's the key. It's another tool in the armamentarium. I think it's a very important tool. I think it's a tool that's rapidly evolving. But at the same time, I, I, would, I don't think it's going to be something where it's going to fix everything. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rabab. And now over to Muskan. Uh, hello, Dr. Avantine. First of all, before I start off with my question, I just want to thank you for that amazing presentation. It was an amazing biochemistry refresher, and it was so interesting to me to see just how the everyday knowledge that we study in medical school can be integrated in such a beautiful way to create these novel therapies. So I want to hear your opinion. So in your experience, have you observed any variations in the efficacy of the metabolism in integrated therapy, particularly in the patients who may have some unidentified enzymatic deficiencies. So I would really appreciate any insight you may have or perhaps any cases which may which in, in your practice which may highlight such differences in the metabolism in these patients. Thank you so much. Well, you know, I think it's, we're early days still in understanding this therapy. And what was really, really powerful, and that's something we're still working on, is that 20 of the patients volunteered to get not one biopsy, but two. And we were able to do metabolite analysis, we were able to do RNA-seq, and we were able to see that there is different responses in different people. And some of them were because of the biomarker, some of them were because of their transcription factor dependency. And once you get into sarcoma, and remember that data was from an all sarcoma trial, which is the equivalent of doing a breast cancer, a lung cancer, and a colon cancer trial at the same time, and expecting to get a rhyme or reason out of it. But if you look at patients with just p53 mutations, it begins to make sense. And so some of our really, really good responders that were durable had uterine uh, lyomyosarcoma. And, you know, one of my favorite patients, I'm going to have to be careful, uh, traveled here for eight hours once a week for over a year to be on this therapy. And I think what I learned from him is that patients will be dedicated to something that works, and they'll be dedicated to helping you understand why it worked in them. And, you know, I watched that patient's liver shrink from about this big when we started down to a normal size which is something that rarely happens once you get liver metastases from sarcoma. And so there was something to this and there's something really interesting going on. And it's really something we hope that, you know, the leadership of the company that owns this drug, which is Polaris, will continue to push. And so, you know, they just used this drug also in mesothelioma and had a positive phase three trial. But they use that with carboplatin and 
uh, pemetrexid, which drugs the folate cycle. And remember, I showed you we had folate cycle biology. And so this all comes together. But what's neat is though I'm a, a, a rare tumor doctor, this is systems biology. And so, you know, we can bring this to hepatocellular carcinoma. We can bring this to lung cancer, which we are. You can bring it to head and neck cancer. You can bring it to triple negative breast cancer. All because the patients that chose to come here to St. Louis and go on this trial really, really were dedicated to really helping me do this. It's absolutely amazing to hear. And I am so excited to see how this therapeutic regimen and how your research and your work shapes the therapy of cancer in the future. Thank you so much, doctor, again. Thank you, Muskan. And now over to Lexi. Hi, Dr. Dantain, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. You talked a lot about the numerous advancements and changes we have had regarding treatment and how we address sarcomas. Um, and so I was wondering what you're most excited about in the future of this field. Gosh, there's so much to be excited about. Oh my gosh, you know, I have had the privilege. You know, I, I, if you get back and, I, you know, I know that a lot of people have a, an amazing backstory. I made a promise 15 years ago to, and I'm allowed to use her name because the family told me, to a woman named Tina. She was a 22 year old who had a rhabdomyosarcoma on her heart. And the therapies back then were dismal. I made a promise to her I would try to do something for this disease. And it's something that I've held to to this day. And out of this has come like eight FDA approvals and a whole bunch of really neat things that are happening right now. If you look in Congress sarcoma, there's DR5 agonists that really, really look spectacular. There's a, you know, just behind the TIL therapy for melanoma that was just announced, the T-spear therapy from Adaptimmune, uh, which is a modified T-cell going after something expressed on synovial sarcoma, which is an embryonic antigen called, or testicular antigen called MAJ4. Some of those responses in my clinic have been outstanding. There's a lot of uh, other presentations I have online about how MAJ4 works, and that's exciting. That's a T-cell therapy. It's one and done, and you treat your cell. There are other targets in sarcoma from an immunotherapy standpoint that are coming. You know, we've looked at multiple versions of using primes, such as cabozantinib to make immunotherapy work. And so, you know, what's neat about my job is from early phase drug development to phase three, I see a lot of hope. I see a lot of new agents. And I, like, I, I, I'm glad I learned how to treat sarcoma almost 20 years ago, because it was easy back then. Now it's getting really nuanced and complicated, and it's a lot easier to go along for the ride than it is to try to learn now. But there's a lot of nuances, a lot of really exciting times. So, you know, if you actually are somebody interested in sarcoma or you have sarcoma, I think this is why it's important to get to the large trial centers to make sure you get access to things like arginine DMNAs or access to things like the, the T-spear from AJ4 early uh, because, you know, I think these drugs are making a difference and there's a whole bunch more coming up through phase one that are really exciting. Wow, that's an amazing story. Thank you. Thank you, Lexi. And now over to Sumia. Yes. Hello, doctor. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was such a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And I loved hearing everything about what you had to say about translating metabolic therapies into sarcomas. So my question for you is, what challenges or obstacles have you encountered in the process of translating metabolic therapies for sarcomas? Because as I know, like, there is like given the heterogeneity of sarcomas, there may be variations in the metabolic profiles. So how exactly do you address these challenges? So are there any uh, personal, personalized approaches being explored? So, no, I think this is an excellent question. You know, when I first joined this field, we were doing a lot of one size fits all trials. Uh, and I, I was one of the earlier people that said we shouldn't be doing this, though I didn't have a great voice at the time. And so, you know, the arginine biology story, which is being pushed the most within a disease called leiomyosarcoma, is just one of the many things that have come out of this research. That same research identified 
out of a, by accident because of all the metabolomics we were doing, the metabolic defect in synovial sarcoma. And, you know, this is a tumor that's very sensitive to ferroptosis, which is a, an energy-based cell death. You know, the real exciting thing I'm also working on, which is a whole other lecture, is the metabolism of osteosarcoma. And there's about at least 10 different kinds of osteosarcoma molecularly, probably more with subtypes. And so when you get into this, it's really complicated to take a low-end tumor you know, and then actually try to develop a therapy, but we've been able to start looking at the switches and driving metabolism in a corner based on fundamental metabolism. So whereas in soft tissue sarcoma, that PHGDH story holds, in osteosarcoma, it's already on. And so when you treat with arginine, you get a whole different biology. And so there is this world where you really do have to pay attention to all the switches. You have to know if you're a P53 driven tumor, a BRAF driven tumor, a KRAS driven tumor, and begin to, or a translocation driven tumor like synovial sarcoma, and begin to harness each and every metab metabolic therapy a little bit differently, which then leads to the whole other challenge of getting these things paid for. And so I think one of the greatest advocates I've ever had is Polaris. They're allowing this to happen, they're funding it, and they're funding rare tumor research. You know, when you get into a lot of, re one of the reasons I'm rewriting the drugs within lung cancer is it's a much bigger market. People are much more interested. And then, you know, as all waves, it'll come back home uh, to, to the, you know, the tumors I care the most about, which are sarcomas. But, you know, a lot of these therapies were originally developed for melanoma. And so they may eventually get there in the subset that don't respond to TILS. And so if you sit back and realize that, this is complicated. And as I mentor my postdocs and my grad students, I tell them, you're, you're not going to understand what's going on for three to four months. But once you do, it's an amazing journey because it's a lot of switches. And sometimes when down is up and up is down, it's really hard to wrap your hand around until, you know, I, I'm surrounded by the most talented people on earth and they really are making a difference for patients. And I think this is, comes back to what you actually asked me, which is different tumors are different metabolically. And if you don't actually separate them out and study them that way, you find nothing. And I think that's where this gets hard. Thank you so much for your answer, doctor. That was such an interesting approach to my question. Okay. Thank you so much. And I will be actually asking our last question for the day, which is for our more junior attendees just getting into research and medicine, what inspired you to pursue the field of oncology? And how has this choice impacted your life? Has it been everything that you initially um, anticipated? You know, I think that the first decision I ever had to make went back to college and, you know, I, I grew up always thinking, oh, I'm going to go to medical school. And then I started working in a lab and then I got really confused because I didn't know because of poor mentorship in the early nineties, uh, you know, that you could do both until somebody said, well, you can just do both. Cause I really was good at research. I liked research. I thought you could make an impact with research, but I really wanted to go to medical school. And so then all of a sudden, you know, I entered an MSTP program from there. I, got to work for one of the most amazing scientists that I can ever tell you about named Louise Chow. And what's important about Louise Chow is she's a, a, brilliant. She was from China and because of the cultural revolution, her family had to leave China and move to Taiwan. Eventually she goes to Caltech and works for Norm Davidson, who was part of the Manhattan Project. She went to Cold Spring Harbor. She marries Tom Broker, discovers RNA splicing, and isn't given the Nobel Prize because Watson would not nominate a Chinese woman. And she was the most clear-headed, well-balanced person who never got too excited or too upset about anything. And the best advice she ever gave me was, get back to work. <laughs> you know, keep working. It'll happen. It'll be okay. And so she was this amazing mentor who taught me my mentoring style, which is I don't drive anybody. 
I'm there to help you bring these stories and make them bigger and make them fancier and make them really shiny, right? I'm not here to tell you to come to work. You know, I've worked for people that like want to micro manipulate everything you do. And that doesn't work for me. If it works for you, this is great. But you really have to not only just understand your mentor style, you have to understand your mentee style. How do you like to be mentored? How do you like to be talked to? And does that work with the person that you're trying to work for? And if you do not actually say is, you know, it doesn't matter if this lab only publishes in nature, cell or science, if you're gonna be miserable for the next five years, is this a good fit for me from the mentor style? Do I want somebody who's never around so that I can continue to kind of follow my big ideas and see if I can do them on my own? Do I want somebody who meets with me twice a week for an hour, but doesn't drive me? Or do I need that sort of mentorship where I'm being handheld for a while? And none of those answers are wrong. They're personal. And so if you get into mentorship, it's not only the style of the mentor. You also have to say, what is the style of the mentee? Which is a really hard question when you're young to know. But, you know, I think one of the... Uh, you know, secrets in life is nobody talks about how they left a lab because it was a bad environment. I did. I was working in one of those labs that was really big and really famous and really miserable. And then found a lab that worked with my mentee style. And out of that, you know, my thesis was on the fact that HPV is a mini chromosome. That was fun, right? I worked for the lady who discovered RNA splicing. The 1977 cover of Cell is actually two lariats in the form of an L. And it was only 30 years later that Louise realized that Tom had chosen the letter L for the cover of Cell for RNA splicing. And these are both secrets to science that are fun. There's this wonderful mentor-mentee relationship that I have with them to this day. And they're, I think, in their 80s still running a full-time lab. And so from a mentorship style, I think it's important to know yourself and then make sure that you're not staying somewhere that you're not going to be supported. I, I love that whole idea of understanding the styles of both the mentor and the mentee. I feel like that makes an even like greater relationship and like a true understanding of each other um, and how one can help each other. Thank you so much for that. Um, so I just wanted to say a huge thank you to our speaker, Dr. Van Tyne, for an amazing session. Thank you to everyone for, everyone for all the great questions and to all of our attendees. Please continue to follow Men Newsweek on all of our platforms and be sure to catch the replay. Thank you. Thank you.